I think the Greeks were very fortunate because they found themselves at the intersection of three trends. The first one uh, was the liberal trend. There was a second trend, which was uh, the association of Greece to classical antiquity, and that was the Romantic movement. And the third trend is the fact that uh, uh, Greeks at the time were Christians fighting Muslims, fighting a Muslim empire. <laughs> Greece, sad relic of departed worth, immortal though no more, though fallen great. When Lord Byron published these lines in 1818, he did not yet know he was destined to become a major figure in Greek history and die on its shores. Indeed, in 1821, the Greeks rose up against the Ottoman Empire to seize their independence. The plight of a country of Plato and Pericles move thousands of Europeans, including Lord Byron, Percy Shelley, and many other great artists. Well read in the classics, this romantic generation saw the events in Greece as a historic opportunity to repay Europe's cultural and intellectual debt to the Greeks. It was the time when the French poet Victor Hugo would have Homer and Mother rhyme in his poems. This question of Europe's identity also constitutes a major red thread of uncommon decency. In this conversation about what makes us Europeans, history is seldom brought up. We want to bridge this gap and cover what we believe are fundamentally European moments. So, as Greece celebrates the bicentenary of its liberation, we just had to cover this European revolution. To discuss these issues, we have with us Staphis Kalivas, John Sarapoulos, and Thanos Veremis, three distinguished historians and journalists. But before we go on, the show runs on your support, so if you like the episode, share the love. You can rate us, review us on Apple Podcasts, subscribe on Spotify, and send it to a friend you think would be a good match for a pod. Every bit of support is very much appreciated. Now, enjoy the show. We are so very glad to have with us to talk about this important topic, three incredible historians and journalists of Greek history and politics. We've got John Sarapoulos. John, you're a veteran Greek journalist, and you've covered the years, the past few years, all the hot topic issues in the Eastern Med, South and Eastern European region since the fall of communism, and you're the holder of a new Athenian blog. We have Staphis Kalivas. Staphis, you're the Gladstone Professor of Government at All Source College, Oxford, and the former Arnold Warfers Professor of Political Science at Yale. You're a political scientist and an expert on political violence in Greek history, so I guess you have to tell us whether they go hand in hand. You're also the holder, author of Modern Greece, What Everyone Needs to Know. Last but not least, Thanos, you're the VP of the Boards of Director and a Professor Emeritus in the Department of Political Science and Public Administration at the University of Athens. You're the author of A Modern History of the Balkans, Nationalism and Identity in Southeastern Europe, as well as Modern Greece History since 1821. John, Staphis, and Thanos, thank you very much. So let, let's begin. Um, Thanos, your book says it talks about modern history, uh, modern Greece history since 1821. Uh, let's talk about 1821. 200 years ago, Greece, then part of the Ottoman Empire, rose up and started a war with, that ended with independence of the Greek state. Can you give us a brief overview of the events and how they shaped the Greek nation? Um, uh, well, thank you, Francois. Uh, what I would like to add uh, to the discussions of 1821 uh, with the bicentenary that we are now uh, enjoying uh, is that there is a transformation of Greek society between 1821, the outbreak of the War of Independence, and 
the coming in Greece of uh, Kapodistrias uh, as the first, uh, uh, let's say, prime minister, because uh, his name was uh, governor in Greek, Kivernitis, which is a word that doesn't make much sense anymore. So I would call him prime minister, the first prime minister of Greece, uh, who m- makes Greece, and he's mostly responsible for the modernization of this country. Uh, Greece begins in 1821 as a pre modern society uh, as a segmented uh, uh, society by familial institutions and client-based networks and ties of locality. People would identify themselves as Christian Orthodox, of course, but uh, born in such and such a village in Rumeli or in Moreas, which is uh, southern Greece, the Peloponnese and so forth. There was no Uh, yet no such identity, at least in the sense that it becomes later on, uh, of uh, the Greek nation. The what Benedict Anderson considers as the um, imagined community, the imagined community, something that you don't see, that you cannot verify with your senses, but you know is there. Uh, This is a later development. It becomes not much later, during the Kapodistrias era, I think the Greeks begin to discover that there are other Greeks elsewhere. And they discover this in a very painful way. They discover it through the civil war between their own factions. So, um, John, you wrote a fantastic article on, on this uh, topic in the Wall Street Journal the other day. Um, I actually highly recommend everyone goes in and, and give it a read. It's a very good way for people to get an introduction of this topic. Um, what, 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 how do these events shape the way the modern Greek nation is, um, stands nowadays? Um, well, I think that the involvement of Europe, of, of Europeans actually, individuals, was hugely important because they served as an advertisement for the Greek cause, especially George Gordon, Lord Byron, the poet, who wrote about the Greek uh, desire for independence and freedom from the Ottoman Empire even before the revolution had begun in his tour of Albania and northwestern Greece back in 1809 to 11. And he was a a very early proponent of the Greek cause, and he, I think, converted the Shelleys and many, many other Britons and English speakers around the world. This was also a time when Europeans were studying the classics from, from the 18th century onwards, and they had a highly idealized version of the Greeks. So that worked both for and against the Greeks, initially for, because it brought many Philhellenes to Greece to fight. It, it, it raised a lot of money for the cause, but eventually against, because when you idealize somebody, then you're bound to be disappointed at some point. And I think this carries on to our day. There's a lot of European condescension towards the Greeks for not living up to the grandeur of their ancient ancestors. And we saw that most recently in the Eurozone crisis after 2010, uh, when the Greeks were seen as not true Europeans because they didn't understand that you couldn't uh, strain friendships and alliances the way um, we were doing in in asking for massive bailouts uh, for for former profligate and spendthrift behaviour, so so that actually is a is a European complex towards the Greeks, and a Greek complex towards Europeans that I think persists. So we'll go back to this uh, topic of legacy um, of this conflict, but Staphis, a few words. You have worked a lot on political violence and Greek history, so. How does this nexus work out in 1821? Is this properly a revolution or a war of independence? You know, when, we, when, talk, when we use those words, we obviously think about America. Are these things comparable? Well, it's a war of independence. Um, in fact, uh, in the technical language used by political scientists, it's a secessionist conflict, a region of an existing state, uh, which is an empire at the time, seeks to become an independent state. Um, so you uh, you have that, and it's a revolution because once it succeeds, it creates completely new relations, uh, both within the new state and fundamentally the conception that people have of who they are and what is the relationship to authority completely changes. Uh, so it's not a mutually exclusive uh, definition. It's a war of independence, a secessionist conflict, uh, and a revolution. 
Uh, and of course, this this is a war, and therefore wars are fought violently. There is quite a lot of violence. There is violence on the battlefield, of course, and there is violence uh, against what we would call today civilian populations. There are famous massacres uh, on both sides. Uh, and uh, famously, um, this is one of the first instances in which massacres become publicized. They become part uh, of uh, a European-wide campaign uh, to help the Greek. We have uh, famous paintings, for example, uh, by Eugène de Lacroix about the massacres of uh, Hios, which remind me very much of uh, a, a similar um, attempt by uh, Pablo Picasso during the Spanish Civil War, the Guernica, the famous Guernica painting to mobilize European public opinion in favor uh, of one side of the belligerents very effectively. Uh, so uh, what is very interesting about the Greek War of Independence is we see in it a number of characteristics that are going to uh, play up uh, in the next uh, couple of centuries in various conflicts. Uh, and in fact, the resolution of the war comes as a result of what Gary Bass, who teaches uh, international relations at Princeton, calls the first humanitarian intervention. Um, and so the Greek War of Independence has in itself uh, is a preview of a number of very interesting developments that we're going to see uh, and that are going to become dominant uh, in global history. Thank you, Stafis. Um, I, I want to go to the heart of this, of this topic today. For the reason we're holding this episode, it's um, wars of independence often rely on foreign support. Again, if we use the American example, we think of Lafayette. Um, but I think in history, there are few examples of a war of independence that has created so much passion and interest abroad. Uh, the Philhellenic movement and its Greek committees all across the continent would raise money, men to fight. And, you know, despite con more conservative politicians who were very much uh, wary of destabilizing the continent's political balance, you had this great European enthusiasm for what was going on in Greece. You know, famously, the Lord Byron fought and died in Greece. And to, on this issue, I want to quote Professor Roderick Beaton on this pan-European movement. It's not humanitarian, it's altruistic. It's actually the belief that the Hellenic heritage is common to all civilized people. And therefore, it's your own civilization that is threatened by the common enemy. And in the words of the Greek poet Percy Shelley, we are all Greek. Thanos, was this a European revolution? Well, I wouldn't call it a European revolution, especially when the uh, beginning of the Holy Alliance uh, occurred. Uh, after the fall of Napoleon in 1815, uh, the Europeans, uh, well, some Europeans, at least uh, uh, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, uh, the Russians, uh, the Prussians, and Britain under Castlery uh, decided that they would resurrect uh, the Ancien Regime, uh, would restore the monarchy in France and so forth, and would do away with the principles of the French Revolution. Yet there is another public in Europe at the same time that reacts to this uh, reaction, so to speak, to history. And this public is the public of the Romantics, the public of the revolutionaries, the public of the radicals, uh, the Carbonari in Italy, and a series of other radicals who are very much against the Holy Alliance and the attempt to restore the uh, old regime, and who fight on the side of the Greeks. They consider the Greeks as a part of this radical anti-Holy Alliance movement. John, one of the reasons we're doing this episode is I think there's a lack of sense of a European history. Um, and, and whether you're a Euro-Federalist or not, I think these European moments such as 1821 or 1848 are not exploited enough or understood enough. Um, will, but would it be a stretch to talk about European revolution in the case of what happened in, in Greece? I think it becomes a European revolution because it's embraced by the British and the French um, and the Russians, but, but the Russians have their own issues with Europe and, and historically 
historically, there's no Russian hold on Greece because there's nothing that the Russians ever did um, to help the Greeks from the 18th century onwards that I can find in history books. Um, there is a Russian ambition consistently to extend into the Balkans, but not in Greece's favor. Um, it's the Brits and the French who ensure that the Greeks become part of the European family. And I think the Greeks themselves also, because there was such a big Greek diaspora in the West already. Uh, there, was, there was a Greek Enlightenment movement outside of Greece. Um, in addition to the well-known Greek diaspora in in the former Ottoman dominions, and especially Asia Minor and Egypt uh, and the Levant. Um, so, so it becomes a European revolution. The Greeks decide that, yes, we are Europeans. The Europeans are our allies and the guarantors of our freedom. We don't celebrate that so much. You know, the, the key dates that we celebrate are the uprising. The, the, the key date is the, the beginning of the fighting, which is in March of 1821. But really the key events, um, and, and I think Thanos and Stathis will be able to elaborate this much better, are uh, events such as the, uh, the agreement between um, Sir Stratford Canning, the British Foreign Secretary's cousin, and Mavrokotvatos, the, the president of, uh, of, of, the, um, of the Greek political entity that leads Greece through the revolution, back in January of 1826, to, to give Greece autonomy. It's a sort of strategic compromise Greece makes in order to win British support. The Brits at that point don't want to countenance an independent Greek state because it's, it's too disruptive to the order of... Um, to the order of Europe and to the um, viability of the Ottoman Empire. So I think that's the, the inception of that special Greek-British relationship that lasts for a couple of centuries. And then it's the, the London Protocol in February of 1830 that finally gives Greek independence. These are the key moments of the revolution in, in purely political terms, but uh, we don't celebrate that. We, we conveniently forget that the Europeans were key to our independence, and we focus on, you know, the uh, the fighting, the bravery, the uh, rising up against all odds, which it was an uprising against all odds, and and that military glory always wins um, hearts and minds and impressions. But um, but the political embrace of Greece by by Western Europe, by Britain and France, is is really formative to its development as a European nation. And from that point on, I think I think Thanos is the expert on this. But from that point on, uh, Greece becomes a British protectorate in the 19th century. But but then a key British ally in two world wars in the 20th. Mm. Um, um, Thanos, we'll, we'll come back to the idea of uh, Greece as a British protectorate, but. Staffis, is there any examples of a uh, war of independence in which there is so much enthusiasm and identification among European capitals, and you know, not just European capitals, but kind of random um, European romantics? You know, all across it seemed like it was a, more than just le, la cause du jour. It was a, something that really much animated them, with a sense of debt towards classical Greece and um, feeling they needed to do something about it. Uh, absolutely. Uh, I think the Greeks were very fortunate because they uh, found themselves at the intersection uh, of three trends. The first one uh, was the liberal trend. Uh, and at the time, uh, the ideas that came out of the French Revolution were not very much in vogue. They were repressed. And so uh, a, a liberal, what was seen as a liberal revolution, and the Greeks did a lot to promote this idea of a liberal revolution with their first constitution, and various proclamations, aroused the uh, interest and enthusiasm of liberals. There was a second trend which was, uh, as mentioned, uh, the association of Greece to classical antiquity. Uh, there was a sense, and, and that was the Romantic movement, there was a sense that an ancient civilization was coming back, which was extremely exciting. Suddenly these people who were long uh, thought to be lost were claiming to, to, to be back in, uh, in, uh, in, in history. Uh, and in politics. And the third trend, which I also think uh, is quite interesting, um, is the fact that uh, uh, Greek, Greeks at the time were Christians fighting Muslims, fighting a Muslim empire. 
Uh, and so that made them immediately uh, very um, familiar uh, with uh, European public opinion. So at the intersection of these three contradictory, internally contradictory trends, you have, uh, in fact, a, a very big coalition uh, that encompasses a lot of very different constituencies. And that explains why the Greek cause uh, was so popular. But uh, it's also very interesting to see things from the Greek side, uh, because for a very long time, the Greeks were primarily identifying as Christians, as Orthodox Christians, identifying with the Orthodox Church. And to the extent that there was a close um, connection they had with another power that was primarily Russia, both because it was an Orthodox empire and also because there were very large communities of Greek merchants uh, living in Russia. And in fact, the conspiracy to begin the War of Independence begins uh, in uh, the Crimea, the friendly society, which is a sort of uh, Masonic type uh, society that uh, begins to plan the uprising uh, is... Uh, uh, start, starts through the action of three merchants uh, in, the, in the city of uh, Odessa in the Crimea. Uh, and so what the Greek War of Independence is going to do is completely reorient Greece uh, away from Russia and the Orthodox Church and towards the West and Europe. Uh, and in that respect, it is a foundational type of event uh, that is going to steer Greece in a very different direction from what is predicated by its culture uh, and its geographic location. Uh, and that is the result, of course, of the events that we have alluded to, uh, the intervention uh, of the great powers, and especially the role uh, of Great Britain in helping Greece um, obtain uh, its independence. Uh, and since then, uh, Greece and the Greeks themselves, and we, we've seen that throughout various crises in history, are going to think of themselves primarily as being associated and connected with Western Europe. So in both the European side and the Greek side, we see how this is an event that is going to seal um, a geopolitical trajectory uh, that is going to last for at least two centuries. I would I would agree with uh, John Psaropoulos that although Russia has a reputation of being pro-Greek and fighting for the Greeks, in fact, in fact, uh, we have reaped a disaster on the part of Russia uh, during the pre-war uh, years, uh, 1770s actually, the Orlov uh, Orlov uh, events. Uh, uh, which were instigated by Catherine the Great uh, and caused a disaster in Greek affairs because the Russians began a mini revolution and then abandoned uh, the revolution and and caused a, a massacre uh, of the Greeks. So the Greeks never forgot that, uh, that they were in fact abandoned by the Russians in the 1770s. Uh, although they profited from the Treaty of Kyuchuk, uh, Kyuchuk Kainarji, uh, which gave the Greeks the right to fly a Russian flag on their merchant pirate, if you like, ships, uh, and did very well in, in commerce and all that. But in fact, what the Brits did for the, for the Greeks is what uh, George Canning took uh, uh, over, when George Canning took over as the French, uh, as the, sorry, the British foreign minister, and then late in his life, uh, before he died, he became prime minister. And he was very helpful because he... Um, uh, recognized the Greeks as insurgents uh, during the war, and therefore uh, the Greek ships uh, that uh, uh, would would attack the Ottoman fleet were not uh, interrogated by the British fleet either in the Ionian Sea or the Aegean. And this was a very good turn for the Greeks. They owe this to George Canning and, and many other things, including independence, because let's not forget that the Russians were interested in autonomy of the Greeks. Nicholas I was a champion of the Greek autonomy, and there he traded, let's say, he crossed swords with George Canning, who was a champion of independence. 
admittedly because the Brits be believed that independence would extract the Greeks from the clutches of the Russian Empire, uh, which in fact uh, happened. This is exactly what happened. The Greeks became clients of England. and. It, but it's a much better thing to be a client of a developed state such as the uh, as Britain than to be a client of an underdeveloped state, state such as Russia of that time. And uh, this, uh, uh, there was a change of guard, as Stathis knows better than everyone, uh, as late as 1947, I believe, when the uh, British uh, uh, gave place uh, to the Americans as the, uh, as the mm, er, patrons of, of the Greek uh, uh, resistance against communism. So I, I, I want to um, go into this question of, of how Greece has felt its interactions with, with the West, because you know, obviously from the interactions between the wide-eyed re, uh, romantics who went to Greece and the rural locals who, you know, ended up falling short of being the Athenians of Pericles' time. These interactions between the West and Greece has always been a bit tumultuous. Uh, in the end, it was the European fleet that crushed the um, Ottoman Egyptian fleet at the Battle of Navarino. And, um, but it was mainly for real political reasons rather than kind of idealistic motivations from European capitals. How does Greece feel its relationship with Western powers? Is there, you know, a sense of indebtedness, or is there a sense of kind of cynical, an understanding there is a cynical motives of a West who has been using Greece as a pawn for the past two hundred years, uh, depending on the uh, cause du jour, whether it was communism or the Ottoman Empire, um, uh, Safis? Well, uh, it's always uh, a double-edged uh, kind of uh, coin. There are two faces to it. Uh, from the European side, as you mentioned, I think in the beginning there is a sense uh, on the one hand that Greece is the cradle of uh, classical civilization and on the other hand that uh, modern Greeks are not really the true uh, descendants of ancient Greeks uh, and to, to push the, uh, uh, the agenda even to a more extreme position that they are imposters. Uh, and so that creates very often... Uh, a sense of uh, being played by, uh, being fooled by uh, someone else, which uh, we find resurfacing at various crises. Um, and there is a famous um, cover uh, of a German magazine during the, uh, uh, the debt crisis that I think summarized some of that sense. On the Greek side, we also have, again, this kind of contradictory image. On the one hand, there is a sense that Greece has always aspired to be part of Europe, that Greece is in, in, in fact the source of European civilization and, and therefore cannot be anywhere uh, but at the core of Western Europe. Uh, Greece's entire history is an effort, in a sense, to um, overcome uh, geography uh, in favor of uh, a close political association with the West. But on the other hand, there is also uh, a feeling uh, of insecurity and a feeling uh, of being patronized uh, by other powers for their own interests. And there are a lot of episodes in the course of modern Greek history uh, in which various foreign powers have intervened, trampled on Greek sovereignty and behaved in ways uh, that were not seen uh, as is uh, natural uh, from a positive perspective from the Greek, uh, both the elites and the population. So I would argue that um, it is those contradictions that define the relationship uh, between Greece uh, and various uh, European powers and Europe in general. But the core is that uh, essentially, if we move away from these ups and downs, uh, and if we decide to adopt uh, an airplane view of those 200 years, the essence is uh, both uh, Europe's willingness to embrace Greece. Uh, Greece, for example, was the first a uh, non-Western core nation to join the European economic community ahead of everyone else. And on the other hand, of the Greeks themselves to become part of what, from uh, a lot of different perspectives, uh, is a different cultural uh, environment and milieu and adapt to it. Uh, so I, I would emphasize the positive dimension of that relationship, 
but from a historical perspective, we can see those contradictions being very critical. Um, John, as a journalist, how do you feel this feeling that Greece is being used as a pawn by Western powers? Did that um, rise up again during the uh, crisis we saw in Greece over the past decade or so? Yes, I think it definitely did. And I think we saw, again, the divisions that Greece's alliance and friendship, really, with Britain um, uh, has caused come to the surface because Britain ensured that Greece um, was very Anglo-Saxon oriented. Um, Dr. Thanos mentioned um, Greece's fighting communist influence. There was a civil war here after World War II, which first the British and then ultimately the Americans uh, <clears throat> helped the non-communist forces win. <clears throat> Excuse me. But, but I think, um, you know, that um, sort of relay race between Britain and America um, handing over, uh, let's say, stewardship of Greece, uh, that uh, also has costs. On the one hand, we acquired very powerful Anglo-Saxon allies. On the other hand, um, it ensured that um, we fought against the Central European powers in two world wars. When the Eurozone crisis erupted, that uh, old enmity rather resurfaced because it was the Germans calling the shots in the Eurogroup. It was the Germans who were designing and enforcing the austerity measures on Greek parliament, which simply rubber stamped them. Those austerity measures are still in place. Whatever you may think about how necessary they were and how well designed they were, and there are all sorts of discussions about that one way and the other, um, the fact is that it, it has left Greek-German um, relations very badly damaged because it became clear after the Eurozone crisis that Germany was going to be the primary force of the European Union, both economically and politically. And that is not something um, that, that historically has worked well for the Greeks. So uh, there's definitely a, a rift there. It's coming up again now as Greece faces uh, a more assertive and expansionist and irredentist Turkey. Um, the Greeks have been asking the Germans repeatedly not to sell the Turks any uh, submarines or other weapons that might be used against Greece or other European Union powers. And Germany, on various pretexts, refuses to cut that trade and insists on maintaining a, a very special relationship, which is primarily an economic relationship, but, but it also encompasses other things like um, uh, migration policy and refugee policy with Turkey. So what's the what you know what is the the greek feeling towards the europeans it's warm towards the french it's warm towards the british who've sadly left the european union um it, it is um historically and now again not so warm towards germany and um uh, and other powers in europe who've historically um been arrayed against Greece on the battlefield and um, strangely still seem to stand across from Greece in terms of political understanding and, and cultural sensitive sensibilities. Um, and, and there are other causes to this. There, there are other political causes to this that go back to the Greek revolution. The Central European powers did not want this disruption within the Ottoman Empire. And... Um, uh, the Austrian historian Falmeraya wrote, uh, a brilliant man by all accounts, uh, wrote a book that is now infamous in which he described the Greeks as not being the descendants of the ancient Greeks. Whether he believed that or not, we don't know, because one possible explanation for that thesis is that he was trying to attack the, the patrilineage of the Greeks as a way of undermining the appeal of their cause to other Europeans. Um, but it continues to this day to um, actually poison um, 
Greece's relations with some countries in Europe, that that thesis arose in those in those countries, in that cultural Teutonic unity of Germany, Austria, and and their associated satellites. Um, so, I would say the the quick answer to the Greek attitude towards Europe is. It's very pro some of Europe and very skeptical of, of other parts of Europe. Thanos, how does this um, history of having been used as a pawn in, in greater objectives uh, play on the Greek psyche? Well, I would certainly agree with uh, John Taropoulos that uh, the current affairs uh, do not make Germany a very uh, happy, let's say, ally uh, of Greece. Uh, I can quote uh, this um, great philosopher of the Frankfurt School, Jürgen Habermas, who called his compatriots uh, uh, a kind of current economic nationalists that they, in fact, crave for selling their goods rather than their ideas or the ideas of the European Union. And this is a very interesting intervention on the part of uh, Habermas. This is what most Greeks believe today. They believe, in fact, that the Germans are willing to, to kill their mother uh, if they can sell a few submarines or any other uh, military war, uh, let's say, hardware to anyone. Uh, and this doesn't make them very popular. But to go back to the main subjects, which is, uh, John mentioned Falmerayer. Falmerayer, in fact, said what most people thought in those days, that blood is the most important element in human behavior. And he said there's not a a drop of Greek blood in the veins of modern Greeks, that they, in fact, are Slavs who have been albanized. Uh, and this drew great uh, reaction on the part of newspapers of the, of the time and other things. But, and this, I would like to come to this and, and to make a, a special notation of this, this brilliant, brilliant, in my book, man, called uh, uh, Constantine, Paparigopoulos, who is probably the most read Greek historian in modern times, especially in the 19th century, there was no home without hey, the six, seven, depending on the, on the edition, uh, volumes of, of the history of the Greek people by uh, Constantine Paparigopoulos. What did he say to, to uh, in fact, he wrote his six volumes, whatever, uh, to answer the allegation of uh, Falmerayer. And he said, instead of saying, no, this is not true, this is wrong, we are part, uh, the, part of the uh, heritage, the, we are the progeny of, the, uh, of antiquity, he said, so bloody what? There's nothing in blood that makes what you are. Blood doesn't talk, he said this famous word, blood does not whisper to your ear of what you are. It's culture that does it. It's what language you speak, what religion you have, and what culture you embrace. And he said, in that sense, the Greeks are Greeks as any Greek has ever been. Why? Because their language is Greek, which is something that even Lord Byron recognized. He said, this language is Greek. It's the ancient language, which is still alive. And this is what Papayoglos uh, uh, based his entire work on the, on the, I, hypothesis that it's culture that makes you what you are, not blood. You may be Yanis Atetokumbo, uh, the black uh, basketball player who was asked what he felt he was. And he said, I'm Greek. I was born in Greece. I learned Greek, my first language and so forth. I am Greek. And of course he is, because he wants to be that. This is what makes anybody what he is, is what he chooses to be, and what his culture has made him into. It's not his color or his blood or whatever uh, 19th century biology thought, because let's not forget that in the 19th century, biology was a young science, and people had thought that it would solve all problems of identity, which is wrong and stupid. We now know better. And that's why Paparigopoulos was much, much more uh, uh, wise than Falmerayer or any uh, of his uh, contemporaries who felt that blood was the major subject of, of identity. So this, this reminds me of a great historical debate in France 
between, uh, well, France and Germany, between uh, uh, Johann Fichte and um, Ernest de Renan on uh, what is a nation, and yet the kind of a German conception, which is on blood, and French conception, which is much more on culture. Um, exactly. That's Francois. You just brought brought up the greatest debate, which where uh, Renan made his own entry. Um, speaking of blood and maybe of bad blood, let's talk about Turkey and Greece. Um, how does the mythology of 1821 still impact the way Greece approaches Turkey and, and vice versa? Now, we talked about some of the glorious chapters, but there's also some very nightmarish moments like the Constantinople massacre of 1821, um, uh, where the Greek community in Constantinople was killed by uh, under orders of the Ottoman Empire, uh, or you had the massacre of Monemvasia, of surrounded Turkish troops by Greek soldiers. There's many incidents which are very much um, uh, haunting. Do these events lock? Did these events lock both countries into this spiral of tension and violence we've saw over the past two centuries? And to be quite concrete, can we expect some of the events planned for the bicentenary to be a cause of tensions between Ankara and Athens? John. Um- It's interesting that you mention the present tension because when Greece was celebrating its bicentennial, um, there was a bizarre statement from uh, Devlet Bakhchili, the leader of the very far right nationalist and some would say fascist um, uh, Chehape party, which is the junior governing partner in in the um, uh, coalition in Ankara. Um, And he said, the Greeks have not yet paid for what they did in 1821. And, and and eventually the bill will come in, which is a bizarre statement to make. Um, what does that imply? Does it imply that uh, Turkey is going to eventually try and reincorporate Greece into its sphere of influence? Does it mean that we're going to have a rematch? Who knows? Um, but it, it does serve to remind you of the fact that history is very much in the minds of people, at least in this part of the world. In Western Europe, history largely seems to be forgotten because people have settled their borders with their neighbors. And um, if if you have a military in France or in Britain or in the Netherlands, it's never intended to fight any of your neighbors. It's It's an expeditionary force to do things overseas. Here in Greece, um, the the armed forces are very much uh, for the purpose of defending Greece from Turkey. And uh, in former years, during the Cold War, from any possible attack from the Iron Curtain, we had a thousand kilometer long border with communist countries. Um, So the Greek-Turkish tension is not only still there, it's there again. It was always there in the 19, from the 1970s onwards um, because of disagreements over uh, territorial water and uh, exploitation rights in, in, in the, on the continental shelf. But now in the last, I would say, four years uh, since the visit of um, Recep Tayyip Erdogan to Athens in December of 2017, Uh, when he called for a revision of the Lausanne Treaty, which established Turkey's modern borders. And that rang, that set off alarm bells here in Greece. I think since then, there's been an overt new tension between uh, Turkey and Greece that has, in the last year, nearly spilled over into military conflict um, on on several occasions, particularly in August of, uh, of 2020. Uh, when two frigates collided, a Greek and a Turkish one, uh, when when the Turkish frigate attempted to do a kind of maneuver to cut across the path of the Greek one. Um, We still have a heightened state of alert in the Aegean, on sea and in the air. Greece is spending a lot of money rearming, um, upgrading its its aircraft, and in the next uh, two or three months, we're going to be ordering a new generation of frigates, um, Turkey still very much dominates perspectives. 200 years after independence, Greece, in a sense, isn't free from the fear of Turkish attempts to either claw back uh, territories or at least forms of sovereignty. And now that game is being played out at sea, where 
Um, the Greeks and the Turks have to settle uh, their exclusive economic zones, um, which is an area of commercial sovereignty, not, not absolute sovereignty. And uh, there doesn't seem to be a lot of, there don't seem to be encouraging signs that Turkey wants to do that because the Greeks will call upon uh, Turkey to follow the precepts of the international law of the sea, um, and, and Turkey doesn't want to do that. Stafis? Well, it's a very interesting story, the story of the relationship between Greece and Turkey. Uh, and I would say history is not really linear, so we cannot really see uh, in the present the traces of the uh, Greek War of Independence because there are too many things that happen in between. So let me give you a couple of examples. Uh, uh, in the 19th century, Greece, precisely because it is very closely connected to Britain, feels very safe uh, in its, uh, within its own borders. Uh, and its main objective is to expand uh, against uh, what is then the Ottoman Empire, which is seen as the sick man of Europe, a, a declining power. So uh, there is a sense of enmity, but it's not the type of enmity that has this defensive uh, element that we see today. Uh, the development of new Balkan states completely shifts the agenda. And what we have at the end of the 19th century uh, is the rise of uh, Bulgaria, especially as the main competitor for uh, Greece. And Turkey, in a sense, fades away, uh, and it is Bulgaria that becomes both the source of all fear uh, and the main competitor. And this is something that's going to last well into the post-Second World War period, uh, when Bulgaria becomes the uh, short name for the threat of communism, the so-called threat from the north. And so in the uh, 1920s, we have, of, co of course, uh, the war between Greece and Turkey uh, that is, in a sense, the last legacy of the Greek War of Independence, which the Turks, who, are the, 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 who follow up on the steps of the Ottoman Empire, call the, the, the Turkish War of Independence. So after 100 years exactly of the Greek War of Independence, we have independent Turkey rising out of the ashes of the Ottoman Empire as the result of its victorious war against Greece, uh, a fact that is sealed with the exchange of populations when uh, about a million and a half Orthodox Christians move into Greece. And after that, we have uh, a very famous and well-known um, international treaty between Greece and Turkey uh, that... Uh, ushers is a, a, an era of peace between the two countries. It is only the um, row over Cyprus in the 1950s that is going to reopen the wounds and bring back Turkey into the Greek uh, geopolitical agenda with some of the characteristics it has today. Uh, this uh, enmity is going to... Um, decrease um, after 2000 with the new relations between the two countries, uh, the f beginning of um, travel between Greece and Turkey, there is going to be a new discovery uh, between Greeks and Turks of who uh, the two people are. Uh, and this is uh, finally going to change again with the rise of Erdogan, especially after uh, his first um, stint in power. Uh, with his uh, increasingly uh, authoritarian turn uh, and his uh, move, movement away from Europe. Uh, so the big hope of uh, the end of this enmity by bringing Turkey into the European Union uh, is going to uh, take a turn for the worse, and, and this is where we're today. But my point is that the moment we're facing right now in the present, which is one of the uh, probably the worst moments, in the relation between the two countries uh, is not one that is predicated uh, on the past trajectory, certainly not on the Greek War of Independence, certainly not uh, on a linear uh, reading of history. And so we can, if we want to be optimistic, we can see into the future uh, changes towards the better, as has been the case in the past. Thank you, Stafis. Um, I have been in some of the abandoned villages in uh, Asia Minor in, in Turkey, uh, former abandoned Greek villages, and it's very much a haunting site indeed. Um, um, Fanos, you're going to have the concluding thoughts on, on this episode. Um, how do you expect this memory, this bicentennial, to play on Turkish-Greek relations? 
I don't believe it will make much, much difference. Uh, A, because I don't think that Turkey is really following the bicentenary celebrations. And B, because I think they have their plate full at the moment with other problems. And uh, therefore, I think what will matter more is what uh, position will the European Union take on this uh, uh, difference, uh, this current, let's say, problem, uh, mainly because, as I said before, the Germans are trying to act as go-betweens. Uh, go-betweens, uh, 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 on the one hand, with Greece being a member of the European Union and Turkey not being a member of the European Union, uh, which is strange, it is very strange for a member of the Euro a leading member of the European Union acting as a go-between. Uh, on the one hand, Greece a member, and Turkey a non-member. This really strikes most Greeks as very strange, as alien, in fact. Uh, as to go back to what uh, your first question was about the relevance of the Greek War of Independence to current uh, Turkish uh, affairs, uh, Greek-Turkish affairs, I would say it's much as status rightly pointed out. It's much too far away to make a, a, a real uh, sense uh, today. Uh, what is, however, uh, more to, to, to that comes to mind is the Balkan Wars in the 19th century, which destroyed the Ottoman Empire, uh, that destroyed the Ottoman Empire in a way, or, or contributed to its d disintegration. And on the other hand, Greece's uh, part in World War I uh, against Turkey, against Germany, against the allies uh, of uh, Germany at the time. Uh, and this, I think, kept Greece uh, on the side of uh, Britain uh, in the future and on the side of uh, the United States and on the side of non-communism. In a sense, one must look for current, the current line of Greek alliances and Greek-Turkish alliances. Of course, in World War II, Turkey was, was a neutral, uh, the evasive neutral as uh, Weber points out in his book, but nevertheless uh, uh, neutral. Uh, so there isn't much of a problem there. In fact, the post-World War II the, uh, relations between Greece and Turkey were, were positive in the sense that they both entered NATO. They were both afraid of the communist threat and Russia. And therefore, there was a period of uh, good relations for uh, quite a long time until the Cyprus question came into focus. Uh, so I would say that one must look for, as Stathis also pointed out, to more current uh, problems rather than uh, the war of independence, where oh, that's really, it's neither here nor there anymore in terms of uh, the relations of the two states. Bakhcheli is a lunatic. I mean, he's not a serious individual. People, even the Turks, make fun of him. I've heard all kinds of jokes about uh, Bakhcheli, even by people of, of the AKP party. Uh, so uh, we, one shouldn't uh, uh, allude to this, to this uh, joker. Uh, uh, but the rest, I think, uh, makes more sense if we look at current uh, developments or 20th century, at least, developments. Thank you, Fanos, for these concluding thoughts. Um, we had uh, the pleasure to have you all three to talk about whether 1821 was a European revolution. And I think with some quibbles, we can agree that, yes, to some extent it was. So thank you very much, Jean, Fanos and Staffis, for a fantastic episode and see you next week. So, uh, François, what did you think about this uh, this Greek panel on Greece's European bicentennial? I thought it was so interesting that we uh, covered this issue because I think there's been a real lack of, of um, any kind of coverage from the more Western Western media on, on this event. It's a very important one. Uh, it's a very important one in Greece. It's obviously going to be a bit more complicated with COVID to have those uh, kind of grand national celebrations. Uh, but I, I figure it's something we need to cover because... First of all, it was an opportunity to talk about Greece more generally, but in this podcast, we've always been trying to cover what what it is to be European, what is Europe's DNA. And I think moments like this, where you had all of Europe, from Victor Hugo to Lord Byron, all of a sudden 
completely enthralled by this issue of of Greek independence, um, sending support, fighting, dying over there. I thought it was a really important moment in this kind of historical corpus of European moments that we couldn't let, that we couldn't ignore. And I think this this sense that Europe owed Greece a historic debt was really strong until quite recently. I think nowadays we we mostly see Greece uh, from a different perspective, um, one of uh, uh, of you know the crisis of two thousand eight, the Greek the Greek crisis, uh, mounting the mounting debt, uh, Syriza, the uh, the referendum, you know, kind of all that recent uh, drama. But not so long ago, this sense that we owed a cultural and intellectual debt was really strong. I have this great quote from Valéry Giscard d'Estaing when they were talking about um, uh, Greece's uh, potential membership in the European community. And you had a lot of people who said that, you know, the Greek competitivity was was weak. It wasn't ready to integrate the European community and his it, an early membership could actually have counterproductive effects. And yet French president uh, Valéry Giscard d'Estaing back then, who said, sir, we cannot let Plato play in second division. Um, you know, this kind of sense of of historical importance, cultural importance of Greece was really strong back then. And I think it was important to cover this this topic for this reason. Yeah, and what I, what I thought was was interesting is in in uh, in um, uh, grounding the uh, historical narrative of what what unfolded in in 1821. I think Oliver, from what I slightly remember, a couple of weeks after the fact, Oliver panelists, the three of them, had a very nuanced view of the kind of uh, of the grand cultural narratives that uh, that you saw unfold at the time in terms of, as you said, other. Uh, sections of, of European life and particularly the elites uh, had a very essentialized, essentializing view of, of Greece at the time and had a very uh, kind of um, rough uh, uh, understanding of... Uh, romanticized. Well, I, I think the the, rom- the, romantici- the romanticized is, is one part of it. I think uh, the other one is, is quite simply, uh, um, you know, uh, fabrication. I mean, uh, a lot of the a, a lot of the um, the uh, understanding at the time two centuries ago of what uh, what uh, cultural heritage uh, had uh, you know been transmitted down through the generations uh, to to uh, 19th century Greece was was essentially made up. I mean, uh, these were cultural elites that were. Um, uh, that were uh, relating uh, Greece to the ancient Greeks, uh, on on which there's a very f- between which there's a very flimsy historical relationship, and it it, it made me think of this uh, particular art historian from from France who a few years ago published this seminal book that is very popular among uh, classicists and sort of cultural historians that is called Le Mythe de la Gre- Le Mythe de la Grèce Blanche. Uh, which uh, uh, which essentially uh, is is a work of art history, and it tells the the story of how a lot of the um, a lot of the archaeologists at the time, and we're talking about the 19th century, when uh, the sort of the the European market for cultural artifacts starts kind of uh, homogenizing, and and a lot of the the, the cultural objects start uh, becoming you know. Uh, uh, mer- uh, you know, market uh, marketable products that are bought and sold between museums and whatnot. And at the time, uh, the understanding was that uh, Greek sculpture was white. When uh, two centuries on, we already have the historical acumen that that allows us to uh, disprove that fact. You know, the Greeks painted their their sculptures, but that's just one example of the the essentializing that was done at the time. And I, I was really interested in just as part of our panel how. Uh, that particular piece played into the the larger, um, uh, the larger sort of roman national as as uh, uh, you know the, the idea that that Greece was uh, something you could sort of essentialize and and boil down to one particular uh, cultural heritage that uh, a cultural lineage that connects the country uh, back back in a sort of straight line to the ancient Greeks, which is a very very dubious uh, uh, narrative. Yeah, I, I like the response I think Thanos had on this, which was, uh, so what, you know, if we're not ethnically the descendants of Plato and Aristotle, it doesn't matter, you know, a sense of national identity does not have to be ethnic um, in any ways. And I thought it was, that was an interesting response from, from Thanos, and again, it harkens back to this uh, debate between the between German and French historians on what makes a nation. Um, 
anyways thanks thanks a lot for everyone for tuning in i hope you you enjoyed this episode on grace uh again no i'm gonna bother you on this but please support by liking sharing subscribing reviewing sending to a friend all these small things really help the pod grow and and if you enjoy it and uh, if you want to show your your support these are really, really simple things you can do to to help us anyways thank you Jorge thank you Thanos thank you Stathis thank you John and uh, see you next time